Hi, my name is Sheldon Livesey. I'm the director for of One Accord Ministry. And over the last weeks, we've been talking about making your prayers effective. We've been talking about praying in such a way that you will not stop, you will not quit, you will not give up until the answer comes. The answers are on their way. Don't stop or give up until they come. I know a lot of Christians at this time of year have been discouraged. You've been praying and you've not seen things turn out with your eyes like you would like to. And it's been discouraging and many of our Christians have given up or they've, they've, they've stopped. But listen, listen, we're, we're not in a battle. We're in a war and we fight until we win the war. I've read the last chapter of the book, friends, and we win. So you don't give up. We've looked at some of these principles of praying. We've looked at the fact that we serve a God of the impossible. How great He is. And the bigger that we make Him, the bigger you make Him in your heart and your mind, understanding that He's still the God that parted the Red Sea. He's still the God that turned the sun back in the sky for Hezekiah. He's still the God that stopped the sun in the sky for Joshua during that time. And, and those many miracles that we've seen happen in the Old Testament and the New Testament and beyond, He's still that God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. After a 40-day fast in 2015, God showed me something. He showed me something. This is not political. It might sound that way. But He showed me what was going to be happening after the election. And He said, after the election, you're going to see the thing, the, the war uh, begin to change dynamics. Before, before uh, election day 2015, he said there was a battle here and a skirmish there. We, we would have fights about the abortion issue or the, the LBGTQ issue. Whatever it was, the, the church would rise up a little bit. But he said, we liken Election Day 2015 to D-Day. And after D-Day, the dynamics of the war changed in that we were in a face-to-face, hand-to-hand combat with the enemy from the time we hit the beach in Normandy all the way through to we captured Berlin until Berlin fell. And so what God was saying to me as He said that in 2015, as He showed me that, He said, Berlin is going to fall. Don't give up and don't stop, even though, the, even though you're weary, even though you're tired. He says, don't quit. Don't quit praying. Don't quit doing what God shows you to do until the war is completely over. We're in a spiritual war today, a war for the life of our nation. But I believe that we're on the precipice of the greatest worldwide revival that this world has ever known. That's also a consensus of our national prayer leaders, our national prayer networks and faith leaders, not only here in America, but around the, war, the world. So in this war, I just need to encourage you. You know, it's not a time. You didn't get halfway through the war and just talk to your sergeant and said, hey, I think you know, my wife's going on vacation and I'm going to go with her, or vice versa. No, it's a time to be in war. You act differently in a time of peace than you do in a time of war. This is a time of war. And Christian out there, I need you to step onto the playing field and be a soldier in God's army to win this battle for the kingdom. I'd like to invite you to be a part of our Monday night prayer groups that meet at Marketplace. We pray every Monday night. People from about 10 different churches come together and we're praying for our pastors and our, our churches. We're praying for our community. We're praying for our, our local area and our state area and our national area. And I believe that as you believe today, I believe that we would look across our nation and just say that we are in a mess today. Today's mess is a result of what happens when Christians withdraw from society. 
Today's mess is a result of what happens when Christians draw uh, away to chase the American dream and we want to experience the pleasures in life, the vacations and cruises and sports and all the things that America lures us to do has to offer. I believe today's mess is a result of Christians sitting in the stands and not getting out on the playing field and engaging in society around us. Today's mess is a result of Christians becoming satisfied when there's a majority. Listen, friends, a majority of the world is lost and dying and would spend eternity in hell. They need us to pray. They need us to engage. They need our resources to send missionaries. So someone today needs to be able to speak up for God. <laughs> today I want to offer a feeble attempt to do that and I encourage you to be a part of doing that just as well. We withdrew from from society from being engaging in government and all of those things and so when the light withdraws what happens darkness is absorbed into those places it's just as simple as that i remember and i've given testimony before how in 1978 i was in south carolina i worked as a journalist i worked as a um, an editor for a statewide publishing company and I was invited to republish some books written by a lady by the name of Dr. Helen Billings. I had no idea when I went to her house, a lady in her 80s or 90s at that time sat me down and had been one of the humanists that had come together in the 50s and each one taken a segment of our society and they were able to infiltrate that and pull Christianity out of the area that they were responsible for. And she set me down as proud as she could be of her accomplishments in life and explained how she hired people and, and had the money to pay for it to write textbooks intentionally stripping Christianity out of everything that you read in school out of our history and out of what it was written in those places and then they hired people on the other side or bribed those people that were working for school districts all across the larger parts of our country she started with the most liberal first and had them adopt these textbooks intentionally stripping christianity out she told me, sitting in the living room of her home, Columbia, South Carolina, the most dangerous population of people in America are Christians, and we have to get rid of them in this nation. And that was in 1950 she started this effort. She took a copy of the Humanist Manifesto off of her wall and showed me her signature along with the signatures of what she said were some of the most powerful people of their day. I thought it was a conspiracy theory. I, I mean, what do you do with information like this? A little boy like me just out of the hills of Appalachia, I didn't know what to do with it. Only now is there a means that I can tell the story. So I'm telling it. I'm telling it because I believe it's not an accident we see Christianity gone from our public places. It's not an accident we see it gone from our schools. It's not an accident that Supreme Court judges have been intentionally appointed who would make law instead of interpret law. You know, according to the Constitution, they are judges to interpret the law that have been written by Congress. But if you can't get Congress to make law for you, if you're too few in number, then you get the Supreme Court and they can make the law for you. So in 1962, Ingalls versus Vitalis, the Supreme Court, if you'll remember that, they ruled that the Bible was, or prayer was illegal in school when it ruled against, for the first time in history, 97% of the people, the population of the United States is called we the people. You remember that from, <laughs> you remember that statement? We the people, it ruled against us. And then it started a domino effect as this same group of very liberal judges began to strip 
the Bible and then and then the Ten Commandments and they adopted abortion and they changed the way that the that our society ran and what we accepted as right or wrong in our society always ruling against the majority of the people of this nation friends that is unconstitutional nowhere on the face of any of our documents are things that they used as their reasons and they they didn't cite any examples they all the things that the rules of the supreme court they broke so it's not an accident those things begin to happen so in 1954 for the very first time the church began to be silenced through what was called the johnson amendment when the 501c3 things were organized and they put churches under that and they said you'll lose your tax exempt status if you talk about politics oh everybody else can all the unions can in fact they can make their their members vote a certain way they can they can uh, intimidate them and pressure them but the church can't even talk about it anymore and I'm not going into the reason about that, but I'm just here to say that none of that was an accident. It was a deliberate plan of groups of people working behind the scenes that have an agenda, and that agenda is to strip Christianity from this nation. We understand that according to Deuteronomy 28, we are in the last verses of that scripture. It says that God warns us. He, he warns us that He will judge us if we turn away from Him. And, and heaven has been brass for a few years. But many believe that at the end of 2019 or 20, that there was a, an effort to repent for the sins of this nation. We laid those things before God. We, we admitted our guilt, and God has extended a mercy on us, regardless of what it looks like, regardless of what you see. And that's why I'm here today to encourage you not to give up, but to continue your effort of prayer, your effort of fighting, your effort of spiritual warfare. So within the last four years, we've seen more than ever a handful of people in power make decisions to control what you see and what you hear in the media, on the news, what you don't hear through social media as Christians and conservatives are being censored. Now, no matter what side of the fence you're on, this is still not political. It's an American, because if they will censor one person now, they will censor somebody else later. That's what communism and socialism is all about. It's anti the freedom through which a government of free people can operate and our founding fathers died they gave their lives to give us a society that we have the freedom to worship like we want to the the war of good and evil is at an all-time high there are ungodly people used by Satan on both sides of the aisle in Washington so I'm not pointing at one or the other oh they might talk of good talk they might convince you of a good of, of something that they're trying to get across, but when you look at their bank accounts, when you look at their allegiances, and when you come down to the, boil it down to the bottom line and look at their votes, they're not voting for us, we the people of the United States. They're voting for what will work out for them. At critical times, they crumble away from making decisions that stand up for the very laws of God. God will bless the nation that follows Him, and He judges a nation that doesn't. Have His laws changed? No, they've never changed. What He said was wrong 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, is wrong today. It's just that simple. 
we Americans need to get our history books out and we need to study the Revolutionary War. We need to study our Constitution. Now, not the ones that are printed today, but if you can find some of the old ones, go to some of the libraries and see if you can get older editions of them where the Christian heritage is still in there. If you can't, I encourage you to go to Wall Builders. And they have information, all kinds of information. They have 100,000 original documents signed by founding fathers and those early people. They have the greatest uh, the greatest library of evidence on, available in our nation. Because if we be continue to slide downhill, folks, if we're not fighting for the freedoms of our nation, you're going to find that very soon America is going to slide down a slippery slope to become a third world nation. So get our history books out. Read them. See what our founding fathers believed in. See what they fought for and gave their lives for. And we need to keep the fight up. A few years ago, East Rogerville Baptist Church did a study, and that study was called The Truth Project. And in The Truth Project, what it said was you can change, if you can change the history of a nation, now, how do you do that? You go in and rewrite the history, or you take part of it out. Why did our founding fathers do what they did? It was for religious freedom, and religion is nowhere mentioned anymore. It, 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 makes, it makes our founding fathers look like just a bunch of heathen that came over here with their own ideas of what to do. That's not who they were. They came to place faith in God, and they wanted freedom to do that. So if you can change that history, then you can change the future of a nation. And friends, that has been done. We can go back, though. There's never a place that we can't go back and change back to where it needs to be. Well, today we're going to be looking at Shama. And I guess you're glad I'm over the first part. So what about Shama? Shama was a man that we don't know a lot about. It, look in 2 Samuel 23, and it's the story, just a couple of verses is all we have. A short story, but it has a great impact on you and on me today, and I believe it holds principle on which we can stand to hold on to some of our prayers and see those prayers answered. We'll start reading in verse 11. And after him was Shammah, the son of A.G. the Harriot, And the Philistines were gathered together in a troop, where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground, that's Shammah, and he defended it, and he slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day. You see, the Philistines were an identifiable enemy of Israel and they would come to fight Israel and they would take what you had they would they would take your your stuff they would take wives and children they would defeat you they might burn your city they would destroy your crops which was all you had to live on and Shama was one of those men that said enough is enough and he stood in a pea patch to defend it so the Philistines gathered in a, in a group, in a troop. Israel began to defeat, to retreat. They were afraid of these Philistines. They were on the run. So let me now use some terms that we might can identify with. Maybe these Israelites were taught, well, these folks are just politically correct. I can't fight them. Maybe they were busy building their careers, enjoying the wealth that they had accumulated, and they just didn't want to rock any boats, so they were on the run. They weren't going to get involved. Maybe they were among those that were lied to, that Christians don't engage in society around you, especially politics. Heaven forbid, especially politics. Not realizing that politics have gotten in the mess they are in because we have retreated. And when light retreats, remember me saying that, darkness comes in. The Philistines were gathered against Israel that day. And we, had, we found Shammah had a lot at stake. Your existence back at that time 
depended on food and he was standing in a in a pea patch in a patch of lentils now we don't know if this was his or not we know only about shama that he was listed as a champion of david and this is a chapter talking about some of david's champions but he wasn't a champion at this time not until after he got so mad that he wasn't going to take it anymore and shama somehow understood that it seemed like this entire village felt that they could just pack up and run away. Shama felt like he had no place to go. God gave him his life and his family and what little he had, including this pea patch, and he wasn't about to give it up. He wasn't about to turn around and run and hide. Shama knew he was outnumbered. He knew the odds were greatly against him. But Shama lived at a time of David, and he knew the story how David had gone to that Goliath and where all of Israel had looked at Goliath and seen how big Goliath was. David looked beyond Goliath up in the sky, and he saw how big God was and how little Goliath looked in comparison to the God that he worshipped. The one thing that we know about Shammah is he did say enough is enough. He was willing to risk everything, including his life, to protect and possibly save his land and the land of his neighbors, his wife and family, and the wives and families of his neighbors, their crops that represented the basic existence that they had. And he took his sword and began to swing it and stood his ground. All of his neighbors neighbors had fled, but Shama said, no, no, they won't have this. This is mine. God gave it to me. The troop got near. It was almost like, you know, when your car starts sliding on that black ice and everything begins to spin in slow motion. One of the soldiers came, the Philistines, and the, the sword cut him down. And then a second came, and the sword cut him down. And a third came, and the sword cut him down. And the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. And pretty soon there was a pile of Philistines laying, and Shama was there swinging with all of his might, empowered by a God in heaven. And the Israelites began to look back over their shoulders, and they saw now that the Philistines started to run. If this was what they were going to encounter with the Israelites, they weren't going to have anything to do with it. The Israelites turned around and they began the chase, and there was a great battle won that day. Whoo! Where was that? Who was that invisible hand that was guiding Shama's sword? You know what I'm talking about? It was a hand of an almighty God strengthening him, making him fearless in the face of the enemy. Do we not need a little bit of that today? So what do we take back out from this scripture today? Don't you love to read scripture and say, Lord, what, what does this mean to me today? How can I apply it to my life and the life of my family today? First, the Shama was just a man just like you and me. You said, oh, he was a champion for David. I'm not like that. Well, he wasn't before. He was just a man that had a pea patch. And he said, you're not taking my pea patch. None of us know what is on the inside until we're called to stand in a place like that. Shaman didn't do anything right or wrong to be put in a position where he had to make a decision like that. Life just sometimes comes on you and dumps these things on you. And this nation has been dumped on us, but God has risen us up for such a time as this. Every day you're confronted with the decisions that you didn't choose to make. In your lifetime, though, some of those decisions are worth fighting for, and there are some that are worth giving your life for. And if you don't believe it, ask our founding fathers. They pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, and most of them gave all of that. If you don't believe it, ask your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, because He believed you were worth giving His life for. Sometimes you're just born in a time of history where there's a war going on and you've been put in the middle of it and you've got to make choices. 
and decisions. And I believe this is one of those times. You live here in America where you have something of value given by our founding fathers, blessed by an almighty God. And I'm asking you today, what are you going to do with it? There's a godless culture that's grown up in our nation. They've united, so they don't have to follow the traditions. They don't have to tell the truth. They don't have to be good. They don't have to follow the rules. They can do things in the slide. They can do it behind uh, somebody's back. Now again, I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about the evil going on. I'm talking about those that are promoting killing babies and, and even murdering babies after they are born, friends. Many, many decisions going on today that are against the will and the purposes of God, and God will never bless that. He brings judgment instead of blessing when we don't do that. And these folks, they're not idiots. They're not pheasants. They're lawyers. They're university teachers. They're judges. They're producers of movies and television. Fully intent to rob you of your faith and the faith and loyalty of your family. Do you hear me? They fully intend to rob you of your faith. Just like the Philistines were coming to rob Shama of what he had, of what belonged to him. So I ask today, where are, the, where are the Davids that will stand up to the glass? I want to first say to you that you can be a Shama. You can be a David for your family. But just by understanding the process, we can, we can stand in our pea patch in this day and age, but it's going to take action as well. We're talking about your pea patch. We're talking about you, your sons and your daughters and your grandchildren and, and your stuff. We're talking about what has value in this nation for you and your family. If you didn't have anything else, what is a value in their nation except what our founding fathers gave us? You can start early with your children and your grandchildren. You can mentor them. You, you know, they're not learning about Christianity anywhere else. You can be that, that person that pours it into them day after day after day. You can be that guiding light for your family and even maybe for, for your, fam, uh, your friends or our neighbors as you could invite them to your house and have Bible studies once a week. You can be that key influence. Find out for your family what they're learning in school. Monitor what they're watching on television. What's coming in through their gates into their minds and their hearts. I'm not advocating this, but one of the best decisions that I made in life when our children were little is I turned off our television set for 15 years. And in more recent years, I've turned it off again. I don't watch television. Yeah, I watch Christian programming a couple of hours a, a week, but I don't, I don't watch it. Why don't I watch it? Because uh, I remember a man by the name of Dr. Percy Ray, and he didn't watch television back Back in the day, this was this is an old time evangelist, and he said, "I've I've never found merit in having to wade through a half a mile of sewage to get a half a good bite off a biscuit." Heard him say that, and you know what? Over the years, I've found that that's been so true. In my family, we had family forums. The basis of the forum every night was I'd tell a Bible story and, and we, would, we would talk about that Bible story. Every night, we would pick a character and we would some of the characters in the Bible are very obviously not good and some are very good and, and we would use those as examples. We might see someone in a grocery store, a, a child that was misbehaving and we would come home and use that and use a Bible story as an example to talk about that, to train up our children to think for themselves and understand the Word of God. We taught them not to parrot Christianity, in other words, not just to act like I act, but to internalize Christianity. When they were going to have a test, we taught them God can make a difference. When you have a problem, we taught them God can make a difference. 
I remember my son went to a, a Christian school, and I re remember in that Christian school there was a boy that was bullying him. Every day he would come home and tell me about this boy had some friends, and they would gather together, and every day they would pick on my son. What would you tell him to do? Put up your dukes and knock the socks off of that guy, right? No, I... For some reason, I, I didn't do that. For some reason, I had heard that bullies usually come from a very poor family and, and they, they aren't given attention. And so to get attention, especially if they're big enough, they will gather other boys around them and they'll push somebody around that's weak and, and the boys will make them look good and, and they, they gain some kind of inner um, confidence from that. It's, it's all false, but they are a, they're a person in need. They, they, they don't have real confidence. They don't have love. And so anyway, my son and my, me would begin to pray for this boy every single night. We'd do our devotions with our family, and then I'd get my son aside, and we would begin to pray for him. And he began to... This boy would be just mean, mean, mean to him every day, and he would do things for him, and he would take something to him, and, and he, would, uh, he, he began to try his best to befriend him. And my son came home one day, <laughs> and he said, Dad, he says, I was able to sit outside the school to, today with my friend, and he said, Everything we've talked about him is true. He dis didn't have a good background. He didn't have a good family. He's never been paid attention to. And I told him about the love of the Savior, Jesus Christ, and I led my friend. He went to a Christian school, but he was very far from being a Christian. I led my friend to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the two of those folks bonded, and that, became, that boy became his best friend all the way through school. He's never forgotten that. Now, if I just taught my son to knock that boy's socks off, where would they be today? That boy might have respected him, but would that boy have come to Christ? That boy's family might have depended on that decision. You know, you never know how things work out. So we can change society a person at a time. We need to get a burden for the lostness of the society around us. We live in a lost and dying world. What are we doing about it? Can we be shamans that not only protect our pea patch, but we're Part of that protecting is sharing the gospel ferociously, fearlessly, not being afraid of, of darkness and what people will say about us or think about us, but loving them and sharing the gospel with them and loving them into the kingdom of God. We've got to be able to hear God. We've got to be able to know what God is calling us to do. So there's sometimes that he wants us to sit on that park bench and he wants us to lead that person to Christ. And there's other times that maybe he wants us to take our sword and go to the fight. We've got to follow the leader. We've got to follow our Lord of hosts. He wants us to be like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego when they were confronted with bowing to a pagan king or being put in a fiery furnace in Daniel 3.17. They said, If it be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not. And then you can fill in your own blank in that. A key to being able to be in right relationship is being in right relationship with God in doing what we're talking about today. And that right relationship uh, is, is through prayer and reading your, your Bible and, and making God more than something you find on Sunday morning. You should have a relationship with Him every single day of the week. He wants intimacy with you just as someone that you would love. Henry Blackaby, in his study, Experiencing God, and, and I would encourage you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, to go through this study. You can find it in any bookstore. 
experience in God that every Bible character in the Bible, when God spoke to them, they knew His voice. Come to the place where you hit, know, hear, and know the voice of God speaking to you and giving you directions. Most modern day Christians won't fight the devil. They, they literally are fighting God. They don't know the difference. Instead of fighting the bands of Satan, their biggest fights are against churches. And they, they fight a church that doesn't baptize like they do. Or they fight a church that doesn't take communion like they do. Or they fight a church that believes in the baptism of the Holy Spirit or they don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or they think you're going to be caught away in the air before the tribulation or after the tribulation or if there's a tribulation at all. And they divide their whole churches and they fight each other over the trivialities. Listen, friends, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're my brother and I'm to love you and I'm to join arms with you. And we're in the same war together. We're not apart from each other. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting the enemy, the devil. And there's no division in God's army. I want to let you know, hallelujah, that there is a growing number of pastors across this nation that's tired of fighting their brothers and sisters. And they are coming together. They're joining hands to fight the devil together. They're in praying together. They're embracing each other. They're supporting one another. And they're on the same team. There are churches that are in our community that are not afraid of each other, who know the enemy is not the other church, but it is the devil. So like Shama, we know Moses at one point was confronted by Amalek. And this was before they even went to Mount Sinai. And if you remember that story, Moses went up on top of, of, a, of a mountain and he had Joshua lead this battle. And so Moses was up there and he began by holding his hands up and Aaron and Hur was there. And as Moses got tired and had a rod in his hand, as the rod came down, then we saw Israel begin to be defeated by the Amalekites. And so Aaron and Hur held his hands up and they ended up getting, getting down and they had to prop his hands up. I, I can imagine Moses was so tired. What's the point? They, God could have started all over with just Moses. In fact, a couple of times in Exodus, he said, let me do that. And Moses wouldn't have agreed to it. But Moses had, while the battle was going on in the front, Moses could look around on the other side in the back. You know what was in the back? It was their wives and their children and all their stuff. It was everything that represented the future of who they were. Their destiny, they represented their destiny was involved in this battle and they had to wait, they had to win it. Friends, our destiny is involved in the battle of the war that we're in and we have to win this thing. We don't want to make it to heaven and find that our children and our grandchildren have missed heaven because of something we could have done. Let me ask, will you be a shama that will take a stand in your pea patch and say, look, devil, enough is enough. <laughs> I won't give you another inch of the ground that God gave me. I won't give you my children and my grandchildren. I won't give you any more of those lives over which God has given me influence. God might show you somebody to give a black eye, like that boy my son did, but internalizing Christianity is letting God be God and let Him call the shots in your life. You can make a law out of turning the other cheek just as you can an eye for an eye. Your answer, though, is in your personal daily walk with a living Savior and being a shama that stands up for himself and his family, his community, and every way that God leads him. When Joshua led the Hebrews into Israel, God spoke over and over to him in Joshua 1 to say, Be strong and of good courage. Men throughout Scripture have been called to step out into faith depending only on God to back them up. When we're willing to do what God wants, He knows that. 
He has already written the script for the miracle that we're going to be part of. Think about that. It's exciting. He speaks instructions to us. He reveals to us part of the script. Our faith comes in first knowing that we've heard His voice and then secondly on acting on it. God then moves in us and He backs us and it's real. We're not just swinging our sword, but we're swinging His sword or He's helping us swing the sword. We aren't just protecting our children and our grandchildren, our wives and our husbands. Those are His children and He wants them rescued from the clutches of Satan. Can you think of it in that, in that sense? You see, Shama wasn't just protecting a piece of ground. He was protecting God's piece of ground, God's wives, God's children, and God's grandchildren. Can we pray today for God to raise up your awareness this year? Where is your pea patch? And are you ha is He handing you a sword to protect it? Whew! He's the one that would have you march around your city seven times and shout or put you on a worship team out in front of your army like Jehoshaphat. Father, today we come surrendered. We used to sing the song, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Speak, Father, and I will follow you. I'll be obedient to you. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how ridiculous it sounds. With your help, I'll do what you need me to do. Lord, you've planted me here for such a time as this. I'm here in one of the most critical times of all of history, and I'm asking you, Lord, show me, Lord. Show me how to be a Shama, a David, a Gideon. Show me my pea patch and how to fearlessly defend it. In Jesus' name I pray. Wow. So friends, today, again, we've been talking about principles in having victorious prayer. Don't give up. Make God big. And this and today is be a shama. Defend your pea patch and don't let God don't let the devil take one square inch of it. Thank you for the privilege of allowing me to share this with you today. God bless you and you have a great day.